two hours of, of recording time. Um, my name is Rabbi Natan Gadayev. For those that don't know me, I'm an expert in Vedika Talayim, which is checking for vegetables. Um, I was called here tonight by a very chash of a rav, Rabbi Daniel Cohen. It's a very nice community, very nice shul, very impressed. He's, he's finally rebuilt. He's talking to me about it for a while. He's waiting for it to be established so you know, you can begin the you know, community routine. Um, I'm here to discuss two things. There's going to be two aspects to this uh, shi'ur. We're going to speak first, uh, PowerPoint presentation, and show some slides, some videos. I uh, give a basic introduction about a number of bugs that are commonly found in produce that everybody in this room somehow associates with. I know that the Rav called me up last night telling me that we have to speak about Ali Fiosh. <laughs> he wasn't sure how to say it in English. It's, it's cilantro. It's okay. I can imagine you go to the store, you ask for Ali Fiosh. The Chinese guy looks at you like Ali Fiosh. Um, maybe actually in China, that's the common language. Uh, but, um, I will try to discuss about different products, common products that everybody uses in the stores, in the restaurants, in the halls, in the wedding halls. You know, when you learn Bidika Tulayim, when I started into this in, in, you know, training in, in bug checking, it was about eight years ago, um, it was fairly new in this country. You probably think, what does that mean? Eight years ago, ten years ago, people didn't check their vegetables, or bugs, they did. But the amount of information from an entomology standpoint, entomology means the study of insects, but from a scientific standpoint, it was very solemn, it was very rare in the, in the Jewish community. It was so rare that people knew that there's such things as bugs, and they knew they have to check vegetables, but they didn't have enough thorough knowledge to, to be able to detail, in a detailed manner, to be able to check every single product um, in a manner that it would require to know how infested it is and, you know, to, to arouse the community, to wake the community up, so to speak, and to understand, you know, how to clean vegetables, what's the issues with vegetables. In the past, since eight years, you know, I've been doing this, I've heard maybe 10, 20 different alerts about vegetables being infested. You know, it, it, it sounds very abnormal. And in, in a couple of years, they take away from us so many products. No more blueberries, they say. No more strawberries. No more raspberries. No more blackberries. No more blackberries. Phone blackberries also in the shivot, right? No more broccoli. No more cauliflower. No more corn on the cob. No more orange juice. Soon they're going to take away apple juice. I'm choking. The apple juice is still fine. No more anything. And when you hear this as a consumer, I mean, I'm a consumer also, it's very disturbing. You know, if you hear this constantly, it gets to the point as a human being, you're like, you know, maybe this is a joke. Maybe there's really no bugs. But somebody's trying to play a, a trick on us, trying to scare us, and they just don't want us to eat anything. The reality is that each, each case where there was an issue with infestation comes with a whole story. And sometimes the story, like in Purim time, could be a 10, 20 year long story, but you're only hearing about it now. When I started learning about bugs, I realized that the people, you know, Simon Pei Dalit is where we speak, learn about uh, the introduction of uh, Bidika Tolayim, checking for bugs and all the halachot. It's a very misunderstood siman, it's a very misunderstood section of Shulchan Aruch. A lot of people skip it, unfortunately. Even, not all Rabbanim, but even themselves learn it. They maybe glance at it, they, they superficially learn it. Whatever it says, they understand. Whatever, you know, entomology aspect, the practicality, they don't necessarily learn. You know, but in the past uh, number of years, I've been doing this, I see there's a tremendous change. But the change is not coming so much from all the states of, of, of the U.S. is coming mainly from New York, from New Jersey. My objective in the past five, six years was to take the Bukhari community and to uh, upgrade them with regards to bug checking. The question is why? And I want to tell you, you know, I work with the industry, I speak to many Ashgachot. And unfortunately, in our community, um, we give a certain presentation you know, that we are not in 
we're not in the world of kashrut, we're not in the world of, of bug checking, we're not in the world of, of the industry when it comes to food items. We know how to eat Baruch Hashem, no doubt. You know, but um, everything else, it, it, it comes with a lot of uh, expertise, a lot of training. So I realized that in our community, our, 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 the ladies, Baruch Hashem, and even the men, have been phenomenal eyesight for checking for bugs. The best students I have, I've trained Hasidim, Litvish, Svartim, Syrians, I've trained all communities. And the best students I have is Bukhari. I remember I was giving a class once at uh, Hasidish. It was an interesting combination of a group, like tell ladies. Hasidish, Syrian, Litvish, Bukhari. And out of all the ladies, two of them were Bukhari, and they were the only ones that I told them instructions, and they were following it to the T. And while the old ladies are asking a million questions, they're already advancing. They know how to follow orders, Baruch And they pick it up really, really well. And I think that, um, I think that if we elevate ourselves in this topic, we can make a major change in the community. I get phone calls in the past few weeks. I've been getting phone calls from Kavah Hashgachot, like OU, Star Kev, Rabbanim, telling me, what's going on with the Bukharian community? I said, I said, what do you mean? I know what's going on. I'm just, you know. I go, what do you mean? He says, they're all of a sudden calling us, asking us very, very detailed, very difficult questions with regards to kashrut, with regards to bug checking. They know what mites are, thrips, aphids, all the different types of bugs, the details, things that we don't even know. They're already telling me what's going to be the next insect alert in the next two years. How do they know that? I said, I don't know. They must be well trained. You know, uh, but our voices and we're, we're being heard. People are noticing us in the industry, and I think that's very important. The Torah tells us that Parshat Vaikra speaks about different prohibitions in bugs. Parshat Shmini. It says over there in Parshat Shmini, you know, Parshat Shmini speaks about the kashrut industry. The whole kashrut industry, it's a trillion dollar industry was based on Parshat Shmini. There are other Parshat to speak about Kashut, but it's really all combined with Parshat Shmini. In there, Rashi tells us a part in Maikra, and that Parsha, Rashi tells us that depending on the type of bug you eat, you get a certain amount of prohibitions. A lot of them. The Pasuk in the Torah tells us that you're not allowed to eat bugs, you're not allowed to eat creepy, crawling creatures. But each bug is a different set of uh, prohibitions. For example, if it's a water bug, it's four prohibitions. I'm going to soon explain what that means. If it's a land bug, a bug that walks on the land, it's five. And if it's a flying bug, it's six. A water bug, people would probably discuss about the New York City water, right? Oh, Hashem, we have bugs in our water. Some hold it's okay, some hold it's not. Most of the bugs we're dealing with in our produce is, uh, is land bugs, five prohibitions. The Prichadash mentions in Semit Pedalid in the end, he says, why is it the Torah made such severity when it comes to bugs? The Gora Makot speaks about the severity of eating bugs. And it says there's four, la four prohibitions, five prohibitions, six are prohibitions. That's where Rashi is getting it from also as well. He's citing it there. But why such severity? How many provisions do you get if you eat a chashron pig? One. One. If you eat a, if you eat a, kazaya. If you eat a, a bug, a small little little bug, it's four, five, six. It's three, four, five times worse than eating pig. Why such a severe? Why such a severe psak? Prichadash explains that you know, uh, people have a very lax attitude when it comes to bugs. They don't take it seriously. Unfortunately, not in our community. Our community is very serious about bugs, very serious about vegetables, especially out of fiyosh. You can't take that away from me. They're very serious about it. But when you go out and you speak to different communities, everybody has a different mentality. For example, I'll just be very straightforward. Hasidim, they're ready to, to not eat anything. I tell them, no, but you could eat it. No, 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 I'd rather be machmer. I say, you don't have to be. No, 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 it's okay. I, this is not okay, that's not okay, that's not okay, that's not, everything is not okay, I won't eat anything. I go to Litvish, it's very hard to talk to them, but they're very, a lot of them are very, very lenient. 
They can't understand why anything is a problem. How can you take away my blackberries, my raspberries, my blueberries, my everything, my berries and everything? And you have to work with them. They, you know, they see the bugs and then they start taking twice, you know. With the Syrians and the Sephardim, I see it's like a, somewhere in between. It's a middle path, you know. I think it's a good path, you know, middle path. Not too much, not too extreme, not too lenient. And um, it's amazing. And the pre Chadash also quotes in Simit Pei Aleph in, in Yeridea, one of the quotes that I think is very important, in Saif Kadant Chabad. He writes over there something amazing. He says that um, the youth of our generations, because they're being fed bugs, that the products are not being checked properly, they're being fed, it causes them to become off the derrick. Become chironi. Religious children becoming off the derrick. And it causes them that their heart should not be, be able to accept upon themselves mitzvot. So even if the rabbi over here gets up, the rabbi in the shul gets up, and he says, Rabotai, you're not allowed to eat bugs, you're not allowed to eat not kosher, you're not allowed to eat over here, in that restaurant, you're not allowed to eat in that place, in that ashgach, and so on and so forth. Pri Chadash says, is you're wasting your time. It won't penetrate their neshama. Why? Because they're eating bugs, it's affecting their neshama. Very strong words. Pri Chadash was written several hundred years ago. And we know that Aruch HaShulchan, he also, he cries and he screams a hundred years ago. He says in Simon Kuf, he writes, you know, Simon Kuf, Saif Kad Yudimum. He writes over there that in his generation, a hundred years ago, people didn't care about bugs. You're probably thinking, okay, the non-religious people, right? No, he's talking about the most firmest people. They thought everything is all fake, it's all nonsense, it's all not true. And he said they didn't listen, they didn't care. And he was crying about it. The Peleyot says the same thing. The Benish Chai also, when Halan Halachot Pesach, speaks about raw parsley and romaine, not parsley, uh, so celery and romaine, and romaine. You know, you saw a lady that's dotia, very from lady, you know, collecting uh, chasa, she's collecting romaine, and uh, she needs to check it, very, very from lady. And he says, well, you know, how many bugs could be in there? I'll tell you a story. One of my Talmidim told me that he was auditing a food service establishment under a mainstream lecture. He goes in there and he calls me up and he says to me, you know, um, this owner is not giving in. He doesn't want to make changes in his establishment. I told him, you know, your operations, you need to make changes. The way you check for vegetables, the mashkiach doesn't know how to check. It's a problem. You need to make some major changes. And he doesn't get it. So I told him, you know what you should do? You should show him bucks. Show it to him. Yeah, he, he cleaned lettuce, take the lettuce, clean it, show him the bugs inside, make him a believer. He says, Rabbi, I did that. It, it backfired on me. I said, what do you mean? He saw the bug, he says, oh, this, this is not visible to the naked eye. Big bug, size of a, of a cockroach. Okay? This is not visible to the naked eye. He was brainwashed to think this way. He squishes it on his finger, ready to eat it. He was about to put it in his mouth, because he wants to show he doesn't care. It's not a big deal. So it's a bug, so what? Not a big deal. And before he was about to put it in his mouth, it fell off his finger. There's a restaurant owner, not Bukharian, don't worry. <laughs> in Manhattan, a mainstream hashgacha. What do you do with such a person? Mashkiach wants to do his job. You're dealing with people. And I don't even blame the owners. It's a mentality. And this mentality, Baruch Hashem, our community, is, we don't have this problem. You know? All we need to do is elevate ourselves. In the end of Parshish Shmini, it writes something very interesting. It says that the, Torah, the, the Pasuk in the Torah says in the, land, in the end of Parshish Shmini that you have to be able to differentiate between different types of creatures. Rashi says, it's talking about birds. The Pasuk doesn't explain what that means, creatures. Rashi says it's talking about birds. You know, there's kosher birds, there's not kosher birds. In the industry, there's different types of birds. For example, in our community, right, we eat... That everybody eats. We eat quail, slav. We eat shaka partridge, kiklik, right? Kiklik, right? Yeah. Whatever you want, however you want to pronounce it, right? You guys eat this stuff? No. We had a very nice event in, in my house. We made, we did like twenty shkita, uh, twenty of them. Anyways, we have a masora. The Bukharians we established a masora for the O. Yeah, I helped us establish this masora, right? 
Sephardim also have this Masorah, Machu and others, you know, but um, some communities don't eat this bird. They consider it not kosher because it doesn't have Masorah. You know, so every person has, a, you know, each community has their Masorah, but um, the reality is, is that you need to know, you need to know the distinction between kosher birds and not kosher birds. <laughs> I'm going to show you tonight different types of bugs. I'm going to tell you what they're called. I'm going to tell you how they, their life cycle. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about the bugs. And you're standing here, and, sitting here actually, I'm standing, and probably thinking, Rabbi, what do I care about what, the, what kind of bug it is? It's a bug is a bug. And I want to tell you two things. Number one, the Torah tells us in this pasuk, and Rashi mentions, you need to know different types of birds. Tell me, if you eat an kosher bird, how many laban is it? It's one. If you eat an kosher insect, how many laban is? Four or five. It's several times worse. And Rashi tells us over there, you have to become a baki, an expert. People ask me, Rabbi, where is it saying the Torah? You have to become an expert in checking for bugs. You reach your destination. <laughs> so, where does it say you have to be a, who says you have to be an expert? So if Rashi tells us that for one lav on a bird, you have to be an expert, I think even more so on bugs, you have to be an expert. I'm going to tell you why I teach you the names and their life cycle. It's very simple. Some bugs come off just with water. Some bugs come off only with soap. Some bugs, water, soap, whatever you want to do, if you don't remove that infected area where the bug is, you won't be able to get rid of it. Every, you know, I, I gave a class, my first class, my, my wife remembers, in our house. There was ten ladies. I had a Syrian lady. Um, her husband's a rabbi, whatever. She tells me she got training in bugs in Eretz Yisrael for 20 hours. My classes are four classes. Two hours, about two and a half hours a class. At most, altogether, four classes is about ten hours worth. She got 20 hours. I said to her, what are you doing in my house? You have 20 hours worth of, of, of knowledge. What are you coming to me for? She says to me, no, Chazar, I want to do, I want to review, review. Yeah. I said, okay, fine. So I'm sitting, I'm training all the ladies. I get up to her. I start showing her bugs. She can't find any of them. She doesn't see it. Mm -hmm. It took me about 15, 20 minutes until she started picking up the, the bugs. It was mites, whatever. I said to her, you don't know these bugs? Why? I don't know. I'm surprised I even have to explain it to you and show it to you. She says to me, Rabbi, I'll be honest with you. For those 20 hours, they weren't showing us the bugs. They were teaching us how to clean produce. But I was never able to check over my work to know that it's really clean. This is a very vital point. In our generation, in the U.S., currently, the Rabbanim are training, have been training for the past 20 years, up until 8 years ago, to teach people just to clean. Not to check over the work to see if the actual produce is clean. You know, you could have a product in front of you that could have five bugs, you clean it really well, everything comes off, no problem. But you could also have the same product that has 150 bugs. And you don't know that if it has five, you don't have it's 10, you don't have 50, you don't have 150. Why? Because you don't check. You don't know how to check, you just clean, you eat. So we're trying to change that mentality altogether. I want to be able to take what I have, clean it, check to over my work to see if it's actually there's no more bugs left. And then I can confidently eat it. That's my gift to the community. To be able to confidently eat something, you know, before I learned how to check, I didn't eat anything. Because I didn't know what I'm doing, how am I supposed to eat? Then I started auditing restaurants. And the Rabbanim told me, if you're auditing, auditing, you need to know bugs. You need to check for bugs. So I went to get training. And when I learned it, I started eating everything. Can you believe? Not everything. Almost everything. You know, every week I check Andy Boy, I eat romaine lettuce, I love it. I can't eat the, 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 those pre-check companies, it tastes like styrofoam to me, I can't eat it. Cilantro, I eat all the time also. I just had Bach's last week, right? Good stuff. Um, but sometimes throughout the year I can't get Bach's clean, I can't get the food out clean. I, I check it. There's over 100 bugs in one bench. What am I supposed to do? I can't clean this. I should spend 10 hours to clean uh, something that is worth 50 cents in the store? No. You just have to know what you're doing. It's very simple. If you know what you're doing, and you know how to check something, you can eat it. But if you don't know what you're doing, and you're going to assume that everything is 
is not a problem. This is not the mentality that people should have. Every time I used to give a shir, I used to always get the same question. Rabbi, in Bukhara, did they have these bugs? <laughs> they didn't eat Ali Fiyosh in Bukhara? They're telling my grandparents ate bugs? How dare you? I get this question all the time. So my answer is very simple. I don't know what happened in Bukhara. I wasn't there a hundred years ago. I know what's, where it's in front of me right now. I know that if I have vegetables and there's bugs in there, I can't eat it. But I can't compare what happened hundred years ago to what it is right here in front of me. But I want to give you a couple of ideas. I think that's important. In the 1950s, in America, it used to be called the meat and potato country. You know what that means? It means that all people ate was meat and potatoes. They didn't have salads. It's only because of the ulcers of working on Wall Street, people started deciding to eat salads. You know, they had to become healthy. The only salad they used to have imported to New York, for example, was from L.A., from California. Salinas, California, which has the biggest industry of uh, iceberg lettuce. You ever ask yourself, why is it called iceberg? Anybody know why it's called iceberg? It's famous, right? Because when they transport it from California, right, if, it, if it's in heat, it turns red. Red is discoloration. doesn't mean the product is bad. So they put it under ice. So they call it iceberg, and they used to transport it to, yeah. But in a number of years ago, 30, 40 years ago, there became a very big surge of ex imported tra transport. People work in import transport in our community? No? You know, you guys are not traditional because in Bukhara, 100 years ago, that's all they did. <laughs> that's how they were millionaires. They supported all the calls uh, in, in the Shrine. So, in import and transport, imagine this. Imagine you uh, go with your family to a new country, uh, to, to see the country. I don't know, do they have services to go to Africa yet? Johannesburg, probably, yeah? Let's say you want to go to Africa. Uh, yes, I get people asking me, can I eat the hajgacha in Africa? Yes. Johannesburg. Yeah, they have a good hajgacha, right? Um, so let's say you're there. And you see, oh, wow, you saw an exotic vegetable that you want. You say, you know, I want to show it to my, 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 my family, my relatives. Avlo, what's it called? What do they call them? Avlo. Relatives. Avlo. Right, you want to see your relatives. Now, when you take that product and you bring it to the airport and the airplane, and you bring it home, you're not just taking a product with you. You know what else you're taking with you? If it has bugs, you're taking the bugs with you. So let's say those bugs don't exist in New York or in America. Right? Now they're going to. I'll tell you a funny story. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, a friend of mine doesn't speak English. He's Swedish. Anyways, I had to pick him up from the airport. He was a half an hour late. Baruch Hashem, I was also half an hour late. Right? He didn't know that. When I got there and I picked him up, he's like, you were waiting long. I'm like, sure, sure. Um, I said, what happened? Why took so long? He's like, oh. He says, you know, he, he travels a lot. And uh, when, he, when he came out of the airport, he told me he didn't take any baggage with him. He's coming out. And you know, you have like easy pass. So I didn't, I mean, I know until recently. He told me that you can go through like easy pass to get out of the airport. No luggage or nothing, you get out two seconds, right? You go through like an easy pass line, whatever. So then when you get to the end, you have to press a questionnaire. You have to press buttons. And he told me, you know, he's Hasidish. In, school, in Hasidish schools, you know, they teach you until second grade English, and then you're done with English. Only Yiddish. learning Torah and Yiddish and whatever. It's fine. And um, he told me that he doesn't really read. He reads. He could read if he tries, but... So he's standing there and he decides that he's going to memorize the, how to press, the sequence. <laughs> the thing is, he was, he was so a little lost that he decided to, he just started pressing buttons. And all of a sudden when he pressed the button, you saw a red alert. Beep, 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 you know, like those triangle, you know, red, <laughs> doesn't know what's going on. And then he see, turns around and sees two black, two big cushions, huge diesel coming towards him, and he says, Sir, you're coming with us. He's like, what are you talking about? I have to go. Somebody's waiting for me. No, sir, you must come with us now. He doesn't know what's going on. And it took about half an hour to explain the story, but basically he pressed that he had Ebola. So they had to contain him. 
and he had a fight with them for half an hour until they let him out. <laughs> so when you're transporting produce from one location to the other, you're transporting other things as well. So you have to be very, very careful. Sometimes it could be a dangerous disease, sometimes it could be just dangerous bugs. Yes, unfortunately. And they multiply. In fact, I'll tell you a nice story. It's, I know it's a little late, but it's a cute story. In, 19, in 1851, I don't know if you guys know history a little bit, in 1851, uh, all the New York City uh, parks were, were um, infested with green inch worms. Okay? They were destroying all the trees. They found out in London, they had a similar problem, so they imported birds, a special, specific type of bird, it's called sparrow. Anybody know what a sparrow is? Same so, type of bird. In, in 1851, there was no sparrows in, in America, in New York. There was no sparrows. So they imported them to all the New York parks. 163 years later, 64 years later today, there's over 150 million, I'm being generous, sparrows all over the U.S. Forget New York. Look how much they multiplied in 163 years. So import and export is a very big factor. Another thing, long-term storage. You know, Rabelski told me, Rabelski was, uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, but uh, when, when he was a kid, it was like 70 years ago, 60 years ago, he told me that they didn't have refrigerators like you guys have. We're spoiled. They had something called ice boxes. Yeah, I don't know. Look like a shkaf, that's the word, right? I know what it is, don't worry. Uh, it looked like a shkaf, right? And basically, you know, a closet, and you put ice in there, and that's where they would put their meat and their food, and, you know, it shouldn't become bad. They didn't have refrigerators. Today, everything is sensors. Come Shiloh and Shabbat, right? But anyways, everything is sensors today. And, um, you know, food didn't last long. It had to go quick. You know, today you have storage, and you could transport. We didn't even have this before also. You couldn't even transport meat, and all these other items would become bad after several days. Now you could freeze it, you could transport it, you could do many things with vegetables as well. But what happens is when you transport vegetables and they have a small amount of bugs, the bugs increase. It can multiply. They have children and children. They're Jewish, yes. But they have many, <laughs> they're very, very, you see, they're very from families, 20, 30, 40 kids at a time. You know, and, and they could transport a lot of bugs with them. And this becomes a very big problem. So when you keep it in your house, the vegetable, there's only one bug, if you keep it in long, long enough in your house, it could become 10, 20, 30, 40, you know. I guess it means just clean it as fast as possible. You know. Insecticides. Uh, years ago, before the 1970s, they used to have something called DDT. DDT is a very poisonous, very dangerous chemical that killed bugs. It also killed humans. But it took them about 30 to 40 years to realize that. But Moshe writes in Yikot Moshe, or Chaim, Chedek Dalit, Tzadik Aleph, writes over there that cabbage in America is infested. No, cabbage in America is clean. Cabbage in, cabbage in Europe is infested. What does that mean? It means that you don't have to check cabbage in America. Okay? Let me ask everybody here. You ever heard cabbage in America is clean? 2017. You wrote this many years ago. No, right? It's ridiculous. Tell me cabbage in America. You can open up cabbage, you can see bugs. Not all the time, but you can see. So you're going to say that Ramosh Feinstein was wrong? Chas v'shalom, you can't talk like that. We're wrong. You can't say Ramosh Feinstein was wrong. Let me give you some, some information. Ramosh Feinstein, when he passed in this halacha, it was in July 1971. DDT stopped being used in the beginning of 1972, six months later. Does it make a little more sense now? When DDT was stopped being used, all bugs became immune to pesticides they started to multiply. And a little bug that we know called aphids multiplied to the point where they became one of the biggest number one problems we have in the industry. Especially for those that eat out of Josh. You know, the FDA also holds you shouldn't have bugs. Did you know that? Yeah. 
FDA also has a tolerance level. After they stopped using DDT, they decided that you're not, you shouldn't, you know, farmers. Farmers also don't want bugs. You know, farmers, if there's bugs in their crop, it's going to eat everything up. They don't want bugs. It's going to be a plague. So they try to reduce the volume of bugs that, uh, that are found in the farms. But they have a tolerance level. <coughs> How many people have a tolerance level for bugs? How many bugs is already considered for you it's too much that you could eat? One, right? As a Jew, it's one, right? Okay, what is FDA regulations? FDA writes 100 grams. Ladies, you know, you, you calculate, you make grams, no? How much is a gram of 100 grams? Two. I'm sure most of the husbands could eat 100 grams. It's not a lot, folks. It's not a lot. It's really not a lot. So 100 grams of asparagus. Anybody eat asparagus? No? I, before, learned how to check and never touch asparagus. After I learned how to check, I always, I love asparagus. Anyways, 40 insects for 100 grams of asparagus. It's very little. It's this much, maybe. For 40 insects. You're allowed for FDA. 41 or you're in trouble from FDA. 39, you're still good to go. 39, is, that's the many lashes you're going to get soon, right? <laughs> for broccoli, 60 bucks. Wow. For Brussels sprouts, 30. 30 bucks. For spinach, 50 bucks. I'm here to scare you about the numbers. This is the reality. This is what they tolerate. But we have a zero tolerance. So as a result, we have to figure out ways to clean it and check it to make sure that there's no bugs at all. That's why we're here today. So now we're going to start with the PowerPoint. Okay? Just give me a second. <clears throat> Can we turn off the backlight, please? Thank you. I really, uh, when I speak, I usually speak about also what the, what the companies do. Ladies can see in the back? Yeah? Everybody's good? Okay. All right. I usually speak about pre-check companies as well. That's about an hour's worth. Okay, this is a very good book. It's called Vedika Tamazon. It's in English. It was written for the American jury. Originally it was written 30 years ago in Hebrew, three volumes. Let me tell you why I like this book. This book shows you pictures and details about the bugs you're looking for and in which, which vegetable. The halachot is Ashkenazi. They do have Sephardi version, but it's in Hebrew. So those that don't know Hebrew, you know. But besides that also, it's, it, the, the, the facts about you know, the infestation levels is geared for American jury. So that's why I do recommend this book very much. Not to mention that I, you know, learning, you know, bugs, I learned from Ravaya a little bit, and I learned by other experts that are Talmud and Ravaya, you know, in bug checking. The halachot itself, we, we follow Spardim. But uh, otherwise, you know, practicality, Ravaya, Moshe Ravaya, the author of this book, is considered the biggest expert in the world in bug checking. So we, we, we Bukhariens want to train, we go to the best, right? Um, okay. This is Ravai is checking produce in a company called Kosher Gardens and Positive. Okay, let's talk about bugs. This right here, this bug right here, it's not called a bug. It has a name. It's called spider mites. If you pay attention to it, it looks like a spider. It has a lot of legs. It's related to ticks and spiders. Ticks are small, right? Spiders are big. So this is bug is very small, but it looks like a spider. So it's related to ticks and mites. They come in all different colors. You need a lot of training to be able to see them. It requires training. You can't, you're not going to be able to understand 
what this bug looks like just by looking at a picture. Believe me, I've met, unfortunately, many people that told me they were able to find mites, and they weren't able to find any mites. I've showed them bugs. You need training for this. For some reason, the males are very small and the females are very big. I don't know why, but that's the reality. If you notice, they have black, two black dots on, its, on, either, on both sides. That's how we recognize them. It's one of the ways of recognizing it. Um, they come in all different colors. Usually they have two, these two black spots over here. It's called the two spotted mite. Can they expand it? Expand it. Yes, they can. Sure. Oh, even better. They come in different colors, as I mentioned. Well, generally with bugs, it's pretty simple. The product that they're eating is the color they usually come out to be because, you know, they have, products have... Um, different bugs eat different ways. One bug eats just the juice aspect of the vegetable, and another bug eats just the solid aspect of the vegetable. So when you're, just, when you're sucking out the juice content of a vegetable, right, so that juice content affects your body and the color of your body. I'll give you an example, which I'm sure everybody here can appreciate. Years ago, they came out with a, an amazing solution for people that can't go to a tanning salon. I know how desperately from people want to go to tanning salons, but you can't, right? So they came out with a pill. You just take the pill, and you'll get a tan. But then they had to stop using this pill. Why? Because the sweat of the person turned orange as well. You know that's funny, but okay. Um, so the sweat of the pill turned orange. You know their sweat turned orange as well. So they had to stop uh, selling this product. When you were a kid, did your mother ever tell you that you look very white? You need to take eat carrots, more carrots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, carrots have carotene. Carotene gives you color. So food items that you eat give you color as well, based on the color of their item. That's why they can come in all different colors, as you, as you see over here. These are all mites, different colors. These are eggs. People have a hard enough time seeing the mites. I highly doubt you're going to see the eggs. I've seen the eggs, but, you know, it's usually not like One of my friends, he's a big expert in bugs, works for a company called Positive. You heard of Positive? Coach yeah. Gardens? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? He tells me he went down to the Museum of Natural History. Anybody heard of this place? Yeah. Museum? Yeah. yeah? You visited the place? Yeah. They have a huge department for entomology. Fascinating. They will see, if you go through those holes, you'll see five, there's five different thousand types of mites, spider mites. Five different thousand. And not one of them are blue. How do I know that? Because this rabbi told me when he spoke to the caretaker, the person who goes around showing the place, he said there's no such thing as a blue mite. Is that a blue mite? Yeah? It's called a blue old mite, right? <laughs> leave it up to the Bukharian to find it. Okay. One second. <laughs> This is it. It's blown up many times. See, it's walking around. Usually, when you're gonna find them, they're all usually dead. But sometimes you could see them walk when they they run. They run very fast. You know, they don't sit around. This I made this video in my house on my cell phone. This is my glasses right my running. Stop, I'm sorry about the, the speaking. But you see it's running over here? I see over here? It's running? It's a mite. It's on time. These are my glasses. See glasses? Pointing at it? I didn't have toothpicks at the moment, sorry. And I saw it, I got excited, took a video on the phone, right? Everybody's, uh, everybody does that. This generation. It's definitely visible. When you see it walking, then you know it's definitely visible. Um, where, did I, where do you find mites? Okay. Is the question, right? Yeah. You can find it on almost every product. You want me to give you a list? You ready? Yeah. Uh, first, let me show you a couple of products. Garlic. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Everybody likes to put the, the, the oshpo, they like to put the garlic, right? Yeah. Without peeling it? Yeah. Okay, let me tell you a little story. You ready? Okay. <laughs> if you're going to ask me if my grandmother in Bukhara had a problem with bugs and the garlic, I don't know. I don't know your grandmother. I don't know what happened there. I can tell you what it is right now, what it is here. 
about four or five years ago, there was a pickle company. Okay? Heimish. You know what Heimish means? Okay? And they were using garlic, not peeled. Okay? It was, this story did not happen in a Bukharian establishment. Okay? It happened in a Hasidic place. Anyways, they were using garlic, not peeled. The Mashkiach said, you know, may, well, let's check the garlic. You know, mass production of a pickle company, who wants to peel garlic over here? Mm -hmm. Nobody. And to buy ready peeled garlic is very expensive. You know, so they just, you know, improvised. Started checking, they started finding bugs. You didn't find one or two. You see, this looks like mites, right? You see the black spots? Mm -hmm. But for some reason, it dries up. The, the garlic is very sharp. It's kharif, it's very sharp, and it sucks out all its juice content. Sure, sure. I know you guys want to see, uh, as you can see. Wow. I want to tell you, I want to tell you something. If you don't know how to check the garlic, you'll never find the mite. You'll never find the bugs. You need to be shown how to, to, to remove each peel, to break it apart on the light box. And I also recommend when you do this, if you do this, don't sneeze. Because all of it will fly off the, the light box. I was in a yeshiva in weeks. I was showing this in Shari Tzil, the kids' school, you know? Man, a couple of years ago. I was sitting there for 20 minutes breaking it apart, you know? There's little bulbs, you know? I'm taking and taking a turn. And these kids, all these seventh graders, all excited. These Bukhari kids all excited, ready to show them. And a kid just comes in, he's like, what are you guys doing? And, <gasps> and everything flew. I had to start over, it was very, very upsetting. But, but I'm just telling you, if you ever want to show it, don't sneeze. You know, but, uh, yeah. Okay. But do they fly, no? They don't fly, no. Most of them are dead and dehydrated. They're very dried up. Okay, pineapples. In a million years, I never thought there would be bugs in pineapples. When they told me this the first time, I thought they were out of their minds. I'll be honest with you. I think. But then I checked it and I saw. But I want to tell you, in your house, you have no problem. I'm going to show you how we check pineapple, we clean pineapple. You really have no problem. It's not your house that we were worried about. So that's not the reason why we show you this. It's the wedding halls, and the restaurants, and the caterers we have a problem with. Everybody knows pineapples are a dumb, right? Mm -hmm. Now you see why, right? It's growing in the soil. You know mites are like spiders, right? They're in the soil. They start traveling to, you know, branches and twigs. There could be bugs in this area, okay? And there could be bugs in the outside. Let's just ignore that part here. You see this? You see how it has holes over here? You see this? The rinds has holes? The bugs get stuck in there. So if you serve it this way, you have a big problem. But in our house, we don't do that. We do it like this, right? So you have no problem. You're good to go. So you never had a problem in your house ever, right? That's not the problem. The problem is that what do they do in the restaurants? They make rings. They make it nice. They make it beautiful. And they serve it to you in the Bukharian weddings, right? A rabbi called me up, this rabbi, tells me what's going on in Queens. I said, what's wrong? He says, I went to a wedding hall. He knows how to check, he's a mishkia. And I saw that they're serving pineapples without cleaning it off properly. Everybody cleans it off properly. I know it's fancy, I know it's nice, I know it's hard to make do without. I'm like, I don't know. I went down there to one of these places, you know, I went to the wedding. I went down there and I went to the, 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 the kitchen. I spoke to the mishkia. Shkenazi. Tell them, tell me, do you know there's bugs in, in pineapples? He's like, yeah, sure I know that. I said, so why are they serving it this way? He's like, you yeah, have to speak to the Ashgach. Mm -hmm. I said, why well, have to speak to the Ashgach? You know there's bugs. You're letting them serve it. You're responsible. Why do I have to go to Ashgach for? He says, if the Ashgach changes their policy, then I'll be able to do something. I said, what's the problem? Can you please explain to me? A few seconds later, I understood him perfectly. Because when I went to turn to the chef, he looked at me with a he had a knife in his hand, he was ready to chop my head off. <laughs> you ain't, you, something's being cut today. It's either the pineapple or your head, Rabbi. <laughs> Literally. So I understood the Mashkia. I understand where he's coming from. He wants to do what he's supposed to do. And you know what? It's not the owner's fault. It's not the Mashkia's fault. It's not the Hashgafa's fault. It's consumers that have to make a demand. And now that you know, what are you going to do with this information is the question.
I tried. But because I'm a rabbi, they don't want to listen. But when it's a bunch of consumers who pay their bills, it's a different speech, it's a different talk, a different conversation. Oh, you don't want to do what I want? Okay, I won't pay you. No problem. You'll see how fast they're going to do whatever you say. Once their funds are depleting, they'll do whatever you say. And then I guarantee. But you have to make a demand. And I don't think it's the end of the world if they serve it to you like this. Does it hurt you so much? Get something else. I don't know. Make something else fancy and deny. Everybody else does it. Why, why are Bukharians different? Okay. Let's, okay. Let's, let's go here. You know what else has... Sorry to tell you. Grapes. You can clean it off. It requires work to clean it off. But it does have. All kinds of grapes? It's hard to say. I don't check every single type of grape out in the industry. But when I eat grapes, I check it and I find. If you take grapes, and you make it into small bunches, right? And you put it into a container of water, submerged in soap water for five minutes, and you take it out, you wash off the soap water, and then put it back into a new container of soap water, meaning empty out that old container of soap water, and then put more soap water in there, and then do it three times in a row, we, where we, we have found that all the mites do come off. Now the truth of the matter is, mites are really supposed to come off just with water. If you pour water on a mite, it'll, it'll come right off. Why is it getting stuck? The mites are found in the cracks and crevices of where the stem is connected to the, the grape. Mashkiach in your local neighborhood, okay, I'm not going to say where, he was telling me that he wasn't able to find the mites, only when he did a shmat, when he checked it with, with rigorous work, he started to find it. But it took him a while, it, 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 it requires work, it doesn't come off easily. It doesn't come off easily. And I want to tell you, I want to thank Hashem that I'm Bukharian. I'm going to tell you a story, you're going to like this story. I was called a couple years ago to Williamsburg, Division Street. Anybody know Williamsburg a little bit? Mm -hmm. I don't know why all the Hasidim like to call me. Anyways, it was a week before Pesach, and I came there. I'll turn around a little bit. You can see me, some of you. It was a week before Pesach, and they called me up, and they said that there, they heard there's an issue of grapes and bugs. They want to see if there's really bugs on it. When they called me, they told me a couple of conditions. Listen to this. You're not allowed to use any type of magnification. You're not allowed to use any type of light box. You have to find the bug directly on the grape. These are all the conditions. So I asked, should I wear sunglasses too? <laughs> I'm kidding, kidding. No, it's fine, it's fine, it's no problem. Okay. I'm in the room, there's 20 rabbis there. Okay. Some of them are also bug experts from various places in New York. Well, Hasidic. And I did, you know, they're all speaking Yiddish. I don't, speak, I don't understand what they're saying so much. I'm trying to pick up the language, it's pretty, it's pretty hard for me. You know, my, Hashem, my wife speaks Yiddish, but me, you know, it's, it just takes too long. Anyways, so I'm standing there, and what they did was they took each grape, they labeled it with a number from 1 to 20, and they took a stick, you know, like a toothpick, and they put it in, in, inside the grape, and they put a tag on it. Like it looks like a little flag with a number on it. And I asked him, why are you doing this? Why don't you show the grapes? He's like, listen, I don't know how, you, how it works in your community. But when a bunch of rabbis get, get into a meeting, a lot of times it never really finishes. So we, if we make them sign and write, if they're finding with a check mark from 1 to 20 on each grape, we will have a conclusion. Otherwise, just going to be back and forth fighting or arguing, whatever. I said, okay, no problem. So I take the first grape, I look around, I don't see anything. Take the second grape, looking around, I don't see anything. Now I'm thinking to myself, maybe I'm doing something wrong. Well, what, what could possibly be the problem? I take the third grape, I said, you know what? I'm going to take out the, the toothpick from the middle, of, it's stuck in the middle, and take it out. I take it out, and I look in the hole, and I see something black. I take the toothpick, I basically twirl it around inside the, the grape, and I take it out, and you know what I find? Mites! on the toothpick. I go back to the first grape. Same story. The second grape, same story. I checked all of them, everything had mites. Okay. I write down, check that everything had mites, okay? I speak to the person who called me, who happened to be, he speaks English. 
Everybody else would not speak English. They told me, I tried to speak to them in English. They ignored me, whatever, it's fine. No problem. And uh, I said to him a little musr. I told him, you know, you come to me, you tell me no light box, no loop, no jeweler's loop magnification, no, no. You gave me all these criteria, but what did you do? You even hide the bug on me by putting it, you know, sticking in this uh, toothpick and removing it from the stem? Why couldn't you just give, me, just give it to me from the stem, with the stem on? He didn't understand what was going on. He really understand me. He's like, okay, but then I heard two Hasidim behind the rabbi screaming, fighting and screaming. And I didn't know what was going on. And they stopped me, and they started speaking English. All of a sudden, no English now. <laughs> and they said to me, you know what you did, rabbi? I said, so what did I do? Well, I don't understand what you want from me. He says, you just showed us that the bugs, if you take it off the grape, right, the bugs will go inside and fall inside the hole. Our rabbis told us that when you wash grapes, you have to immediately take it off the stem and wash it that way. But the bugs fall inside the hole. So you can't do that. I said, you know what your problem is? You're not Bukharian. Because Bukharians never serve grapes off the stem. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? So I thank the Bukharians that they understand this. You never serve. And then I called Ramon Shavai. I was talking to him about it. He's like, yeah, I told them. You have to keep it on the stem. They didn't listen to me. <laughs> it's good you show them, show them more. You know. I said, I don't know. I grew up in the family. You know, you clean the grapes on the stem. You don't take it off the stem. What are you doing? But the truth is, but seriously speaking, once it comes off the stem, there's a very big chance the bugs will get inside. So you have to be very careful with that um, when you're cleaning it in soap water three times. Or if you cut the top off. What we did was we put it in soap water for five minutes. It's a possibility. It's a good question. You could maybe wash it. It's true, but you really try to save that half, that half uh, grape. It's so important. Uh, here, uh, it's, yes, theoretically. Theoretically, I'll go for it. You can cut it. Well, cut it he's saying that if you cut off the half, he's very good. See, it's definitely fine. If you cut off the half, if there's no hole, it so you can just wash it off. It's true. Yeah, you, can. you could do that, but it's not necessary to do that. You can't serve a half a grape in the house. <laughs> You have a lot of half a grapes in the house. I, I, I don't know. You might even have a half a house or a half a person because your wife. Huh. Um, but seriously speaking, for the husband. Okay. Uh, the next bug we're going to discuss now is called thrips. That was spider mites. You can find it on dill, parsley, uh, cilantro, uh, cabbage, scallions, leek, uh, iceberg, romaine strawberries, almost everything, and everything else I, I mentioned. So you see how important it is to know it. Can I ask a question? What? Can I ask a question? You could. You might ask asking when I finish. Is that okay? Okay. okay. Just remember it. I'm not going to forget. Okay. Thrips. you got to go faster. It's getting late. It's very late. Thrips, you know, have a life cycle. They're much bigger. Baruch Hashem. The average size thrip is the size of a number in the dollar bill for the year. Let's say it says in the dollar bill, right next to it, in God we trust. Right, it says over there, uh, 1999. So each of those numbers is one millimeter in size. Okay? If you can't see those numbers, then you should definitely not learn how to check for bugs. Because those numbers everybody can see. Okay? They get to about, they're usually, when they're very, very small, show you. Yeah. This is an egg. You won't see an egg, but when they're about this size, this is called thrips larvae. Larvae means worm in fancy terms for entomology. Okay? Thrips larvae, this one, is about a half a millimeter, a little bit less in size. As they get bigger, they get bigger, they get bigger, they become full-fledged thrips. By the way, you never say the word thrip. You're wrong. You say it. It's always plural. Speak to entomologists and you say the word thrip, they will scold you. You went to school, right? Yeah, they, they're dig right? You know. Rabbi scold you if you die for that mood, right? Do you say the wrong word? We'll also, also scold you for this. Um, anyway, so thrips. It's always plural. When they become large and, you know, they, they have wings, and their wings, uh, you know, they, they, they don't fly. They're bad flyers. But what they do is, let's say they want to go from one product to another product, one vegetable to another vegetable, they eat the vegetable up, kill the vegetable, what they're eating and, you know, feeding. Then they open up the wings, they spread the wings open, and then they fly from one product to another product. Mm -hmm. They don't jump. 
That will be the next bug. The one you find in your all the time. We'll get this one. <laughs> now, so they're usually, when they're born, they're usually yellow, but they can be any color based on what color, what product they're eating. Second. Based on what product they're eating. This is half a millimeter size. Let's go a little faster. This is thrips. Why are they black? So some tell me that it's because they get scorched under the sun, they get a nice suntan. <laughs> they don't need to take any pills for that, right? <laughs> Suntanning pills. And that's why. I don't know. But they really do come in all colors. Some would probably say they look very nice. But not when they're in your food. <laughs> See those really, really powerful eyes. You know, when you're looking in the vegetable and you find them, you see those eyes just staring at you sometimes. <laughs> Average size thrips, as we mentioned, is one millimeter in size. They're very noticeable, by the way. Strawberries. Don't take away the strawberries, Rabbi. <laughs> I went to one, one house, you know, and the wife told me, my husband loves strawberries. Take away the strawberries, your life is over. You can take everything else away. I went to a Persian community in Great Neck. I gave a shirt to the Persian community, and um, I, I didn't, I didn't intend to take everything away from them, but they were ready to take everything away. Anything I mentioned, oh, it's a problem. Won't eat it. Like Caesar community, so you know. And uh, when I got to corn on the cob, you know, they were very upset. But strawberries, they didn't have a problem. I don't know why. You know, it was very interesting. Let me tell you about strawberries. I wanted to understand to make an informed decision of what the problem is and what's going on, and then you'll understand better what the issue is. I think it's very important to be knowledgeable of what's going, what the problem is. If you notice over here, there's a thrips over here running. Can you pay attention? It's gonna, it's gonna repeat. As you watch, you see the follow the knife, you'll see it's running. If you notice over here, there's seeds, right? Look how big, big the bug is, look how big the seeds are. Thrips like people, when it's cold, want to get into a warm area. So people will put on coats if it's snowing, right? If it's freezing outside, you put on a coat. Thrips don't have coats, right? They don't have manufacturers making coats, right? So what they do is they look for a safe haven or a cave, somewhere to hide. So they go and nestle underneath the seeds. So if they're nestling underneath the seeds, you could use water, you could use soap, you could use whatever you want. When they're ready to come out, they're coming out after you did all your job and it's dry again, the product. That's the problem. Ah, you're going to say, Rabbi Gadev, I don't understand something. 25 years, we're only eating strawberries, right? And now five, six, seven years ago, they tell me no more strawberries and that there's a problem now? What happened years before then? They didn't know? And let me tell you what they told me. You're going to like this. They said that, yeah, you know what happened? The strawberries back in the days, 10, 15 years ago, we only found big bugs, big thrips. Now we're finding the baby ones, the trips larvae, the, the worm stage, baby ones. Let me ask you a question, ladies. In my in mortal gates, ladies. Everybody who has children, right? Do you leave your children at home with themselves? Or do you take your children everywhere you go? It's a, it's a rhetorical question, right? Obviously, you don't leave the kids alone because they're underage, right? Okay. With regards to bugs as well, you think that the, only the mother and father are going to be around on the strawberry? The children are going to be... They, they went, they, they, they didn't come with them? The children are there. I, I felt it was a very, it was, it was a very tricky answer. So the problem is like this. If I take strawberries and I wash it with soap water, like several hashgachot say, take it, put it in soap water, agitate it for five minutes, take off the green part, right? Rub each strawberry with your fingers, Right? And then I check it afterwards, and I find no bugs. Can I eat it? I'm asking, if I check it and there's no bugs, can I eat it? It makes sense to say yes, right? Shulchan Aruch says, clear the same pedal. Checked it, you cleaned it, there's no bugs, no problem, right? Okay. Here's the problem. I'm experimenting now, okay? I'm not OCD, but I'm telling you this. I took the strawberries, the way the, the, the guides say. I cut off the green part. Soap water, I did everything they told me to do. I checked it. I didn't find any bugs. And then I rechecked it. I didn't find any bugs. And then I rechecked it and I started finding bugs. At first I found only one. 
then I found two, then I found three. You're probably thinking, what's going on, right? How does that make sense? And the answer is, since it gets underneath the seeds, it hides in there. And when it feels it's ready to come out, safe, that's when it starts to come out. So it's not the problem, one second, so it's, we're getting to the peeling. So it's not the problem that I didn't do my job as a Jew. It's the problem that the method of cleaning isn't working. And when a method of cleaning doesn't work, what do you expect us to tell you? It's a problem. So that's why you'll have rabbis, some rabbis tell you, peel the strawberry, which is not a problem. You peel it, you wash it, you're good to go. But some hashgachot will tell you, no, you could still follow this method. Why? I went to Ravelsky, and I spoke to Ravelsky about this. He said, you know, tell him everything I did. He says to me, Rabbi Gadai, I have a question. Are you OCD? <laughs> I said, of course not. I'm just experimenting. Like I just told you, I'm, not a, I'm just experimenting. I wanted to see if the method works. I'm not saying this is how I'm going to check a product. You think I have nothing better to do for two hours checking the for strawberries? Of course not. I know that you like the video keeping going on and on. And on. It's, really, it's getting, making me nauseous, right? Anyways, so, so he says to me that if you did your job of cleaning and you did your job of checking, you're not required to do more than that. So when I speak to people, I tell them, listen, there's two directions here. There's the peeling direction, and there's the other hashkachot that say, you checked it, it's clean, that's it. You don't have to be worried that maybe it's still infested. Why? There's a din called miyat hamatsu and miyat shanamatsu. If a product is less than 10% of a chance of being infested, you're not required to check the product. Maybe, maybe, there's a pro maybe there's a bug there. Since it's less than 10% of probability, you're not required to check it. I'll give you an example. Potatoes. Anybody check potatoes for bugs? If I saw a person checking potatoes, you think they're weird, they're strange? <laughs> I, I definitely would. I would think they're strange, something wrong with them. Cucumbers. People check cucumbers? No, no, no. Carrots? Okay, maybe carrots, if it's really bad batch, you know. Onions? Check onions? Yeah. Onions could actually have thrips, yes. You have to look at the onion, it has to be a certain, uh, it has to be tightly packed, whatever, there's terms and conditions. So certain things we know that don't have bugs, you're not required to check it. So since you're not required, what if there was a bug? One lady calls me, Rabbi, I just checked a potato and I found a worm! Does that mean we all have to check potatoes from now on? She asked me that. I said, no. What do you mean I found a potato with a worm? I said, wonderful, take the next potato, it's probably clean. <laughs> yeah, that's not how it works. There's, there's guidelines. It has to be a certain percentage of infestation consistently throughout the year. You know, certain products are not infested throughout the whole year. You want to hear an example? Raspberries. Raspberries are not infested throughout the whole year. Certain times throughout the year, they're infested only a small amount. Certain times throughout the year, they're infested all the time. It really depends on the months and the seasons and the weather. I'm not saying that you can eat raspberries as a result. I'm just telling you an idea. You know, in, um, in Queens, they should be blessed. Um, Queens, with Alifiosh, they have a certain bug, which we're going to soon discuss, that all other communities don't really have such a problem with. But the Meshkichim in Queens tell me that they always have a problem with this bug, which makes their life very difficult. We're going to soon discuss that. But this is basically it. With the strawberries, I recommend people should peel because it's very unlikely to be able to get all the bugs out. You could have sometimes 10 bugs. You could have sometimes 100 bugs. You know, what unfortunately. Made, what made the rough feel like there was bugs after you checked it a few times? I didn't feel it. I saw them. I found them. Oh, you saw them. I have a way of checking that I could check several times. And I guess, you know, I'll know if it's clean. When I eat something, I want to be fully confident that's 100% kosher. I don't eat in a restaurant if I think that there's a question on the restaurant. You understand what I'm saying? If I know the hashgach is good, that's all I eat in the restaurant. If I think the hashgach is questionable, then I won't eat in the hashgach, right? Same too with vegetables. If I think the, the vegetable, it could have bugs, I don't want to eat the vegetable. Does it make sense or I'm saying something strange? No? So which or you don't care if there's... Hashgach on vegetables? So, Baruch Hashem, we have several. We have uh, positive, we have kosher gardens, we have an assortment of every different type of vegetable from these two companies. Also, we have a company called Began and Eden, which sell only frozen, which are very good as well. Okay. If you go to a restaurant, right, you see that has got here? We're dealing with bugs right now. If you want to ask me a private question, you can ask me. I, I got you from the first time.
Push to it. Can I just ask you about the strawberries? If I peel the skin, is that enough? Or I'm sorry? If I peel the skin off the strawberries, do I still have to continue looking at it? No. Once you peel and you, uh, you peel the, the thinnest layer, all the, the seeds are not there anymore. Yeah. So there's no problem. If there was no seeds on, on uh, strawberries, you would have no problem altogether. Let's get into something more deeper and more upsetting. <laughs> Smoothies. Huh? Everybody, half the people are going to get up now. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Years ago, it was believed that if you blend a product that has bugs, all the bugs will become crushed up and there won't be any whole bugs. It was believed that. Until some of us, um, don't throw tomatoes at me, some of us decided to take samples of this liquid and check it. Yes, you could check it. It's not that hard to check. I could show it to you. Not here. I don't have um, smoothies here. Anybody have smoothies here? Uh, anyways, but I don't have smoothies here. But it's not a big deal to check. Now, if you clean the strawberry really, really, really well, and then you make a smoothie, that's a separate talk. I'm talking about when you go to a restaurant, or you go to a juice bar, which people tell me, Rabbi, I want to go to the juice bar on 47, that doesn't have much And they're making me strawberries and raspberries and blueberries and blackberries as a, as a, as a, as a smoothie. It looks so delicious and yum, I can't, I can't say no. You know? And I want to know in my lab. Forget about equipment, if there's an equipment issue. I don't know. I wouldn't touch it for equipment, but let's say, let's talk about the bug aspect, right? As you know, they're not cleaning nothing. If you think they're cleaning something, you're, you're in la la land. They're taking it straight out of the container, dumping it into that machine, and assuming that all the bugs will be gone. Now, there is a din called the about there, so the chathila. You're not allowed to crush up bugs intentionally. There is such a halacha. But if it's, uh, if it's anywhere between 49 to 10% infestation, miya tamatsui, it's only the Rabbanan, and you're not intentionally trying to crush up bugs. The person just wants, the guy who just wants to make a juice for you, there are those that are lenient and they allow it. There are those that are lenient and allow it. You look in Yaakov Yosef, he speaks about it very thoroughly. He speaks about strawberries and other things. Now, let's say hypothetically, in your dreams, and even in your dreams, after you, even in your dreams when you're dreaming, it's not true, but let's say hypothetically, <laughs> You assume that all the bugs are crushed. Now that I checked it, I see that there's whole bugs. It says it's in Shinyar De Simakuf, it speaks over there, over there about whole insects. It says that if you take a bug, right, and, you, and it's crushed up, and it's mixed in a, in a combination of a product where it cannot be found anymore, right, so that combination is about the Bashishim, it's, it's not a problem. If it happened by accident, it was intentional, and there's no din of about this, it's the but if there's a whole bug in there, and you can't remove it, the whole food is probably us or kidding you. Until you sift or, or strain all the product. So blending does not work. Don't worry about it. It's not a, it's, I have a simpler solution. I'm going to get it for that one. Um, I have a simpler solution. In your homes, you have blenders, right? No, 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 no. You speak to your husbands and you say, Rabbi Gadai, I've said so. You gotta get juicers. You know what a juicer is? Yeah? So juicers crush much better. You know they have the juicing option? Now you would have to check it also to make sure that your juicing works. But blending does not work. Okay? You still have pieces in there. The bugs are fully intact. It's still berries in there. It wouldn't help. Okay? Forget about Yemen Watson for a minute. I'm just discussing if the berry, if there's any fully intact insects, and there are, okay? Use frozen fruit? So when you go to the store and, and they make you such a shake, and they're using all strawberries and they're not cleaning those strawberries, and they're making all those cetarium, whatever the cetarium are, I want to tell you that whole bugs can still be in there. You can check it, it's not a big deal to check. What's your question? Frozen kills bugs, but does not make the bugs disappear. There was a very big joke in our in our, my circles. Somebody once said that if you if you take a bug and you freeze it, that its eyes will pop out of its head or something. <laughs> it was a very funny joke. It's a joke. It's not true. In fact, in my freezer in the basement where nobody could touch it, of course, 
I have, I, you know, when I train people, I don't bring produce that doesn't have bugs. Otherwise, we need rubber diet for, right? I bring stuff that has bugs. I have bugs that are frozen for over 10 years, fully intact. No, it has eyes, don't worry. Okay? They used to make this joke. Now we know it's not true. Whatever. It's unfortunate some people still have that mentality. But anyways, what about yogurts? I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but there's some good news as well. You see, we, I also eat yogurt. We also, we're butter, we also eat yogurts. So we, fix, we helped you. What did we do? Let me tell you what we did for you. I went to, the, went to the stores, and we saw that they have yogurt with strawberries. Pieces. You know, you remember when you were a kid, you opened up a, 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 a strawberry a yogurt? It looks really good and yummy. I'm getting excited just thinking about it, right? <laughs> and you see pieces in there, right? If you go now to the store with the real good, good half shutters, you don't see that anymore. You can thank us. You can clap. It's fine. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Anyways, why? You know what strawberries they're using? They're not using greenhouse grown strawberries. They're not using strawberries that were checked under Ashgaf. You know what they're doing? If you ever go to a store, even a Jewish store in, in Queens, right? You'll see they sell strawberries that are frozen in a Jewish store, okay? And then you ask the Ashgafa, excuse me, how are you selling frozen strawberries is no Ashgafa on it? So you know what they're going to tell you? If you look in online, you'll see certain Ashgafot say that if it's frozen, right, and it doesn't have any questionable ingredients, I could give you names of Ashgafot, I don't want to right now. This will be recorded, of course. Um, they allow it. I went to Aaron's. You know what? I'll give you a name. It's not a big deal. They, they'll actually be thankful. I went to Aaron's and I was talking to the to certain Meshgiyev there and he tells me, you know, I'm checking those bags. I check it and I find full of trips. And I don't understand the Hashgacha. So I said, you know, I don't mean to be obnoxious, rude, or, you know, but why are you selling it if you know there's bugs in there? Separate question, right? But seriously speaking, they take strawberries that are frozen. Now, frozen operations are as follows. They go through a basic power wash of just water. No soap, no nothing. Just water. And then they freeze it. Do you believe that all bugs will come off just with water from strawberries? Apparently, the Hassan Hashgachot believe that it does. And they allow people to use it. Not all Hashgachot are like this, but there are some like that. So what we commit to companies to do is because yogurt companies, I don't know if you're aware of this, I hope this is not a deal breaker as well. In America, when you see a product, it says on it, mainstream mashgacha, and it's yogurts, soft cheeses, there is no mashgiach timidi. I'm sorry to tell you. Now it depends on if it's a hamish, a chassis, a mashgacha, maybe. But mainstream, what? No, no, it's fine. They should hear it. I'm talking to them. But mainstream Hachshirim, they don't have Meshkiyach Tamidi. A lot of them do not have. Mm -hmm. Even names as well. I don't need to. Even Chal of Israel? Even Chal of Israel. They use video cameras? They could have video cameras as well. But let me explain something to you. There's a Psaka of Hankin. Okay? Rav Hankin was the Gadolder before Moshe Feinstein. He holds that it doesn't fall under the prohibition of Gvinat Akum for soft cheeses. Okay? So therefore, you don't need... You don't need much gift to me. You understand? So these companies that are making these yogurts do not have much gift checking strawberries on site and putting it into your yogurts. So if they if the hashgaf if the I'm sorry if the company is not Jewish, which many times they aren't, okay, they're not going to use baidik strawberries. They're not going to be using bagan or anything whatever these company strawberries. They're going to be using the strawberries I just mentioned that are frozen and goes through a basic wash. So some Ashgachas told me, I asked them, I said, some Ashgachas told me, yeah, you know what, it's me, Chinam Matsui, and therefore, we, we allowed to use those strawberries. I just told you, Rabbani from the own community, Fanazim, in Aaron's told me, that they check and they find all the time, they don't understand what's going on. It's a good question. So what we did was we convinced them to use artificial flavors, or strawberry juice, raspberry juice, blackberry juice. When you see those words, it's fine. Okay? Concentrate is fine. But actual fruit is a problem. It's problematic. Okay? 
because they're not using checked ones. They're just it's basic wash. Okay? Years ago, people believed that cabbage grows closed. I have some bad news for you. Cabbage does not grow closed. I have, it's funny, I have grandmothers calling me and telling me, I remember in Bukhara, the cabbage grew closed. I said, I mean, why are they telling me this? They want to be able to just check the first six to eight layers. And the core, they don't have to check. I went to a restaurant in Queens, and I saw that they, they quarter it. They take out the first several layers, and they quarter it, and they serve it that way. Not checked. They check the first eight layers out. So there was a Ashgacha 20 years ago that used to make this statement. He did Teshuvah, the, the, the Paisik, because he didn't know. He, had, he hired an expert that works for his Ashgacha. I'm going to say the name. Rav Hainim from the Star Cape. He used to say that this is not a problem. He didn't, again, it's not his fault. He's not, he doesn't go around checking arms. I mean, he has people doing that. He's the Paisik. People bring the information, he passes. So at that time, the person who gave information would give him more information. Now he hired a rabbi, his name is Rabbi Tendler, he's very good, a big expert. And he told them this is not a correct information, so they changed their policy. Unfortunately, that policy wasn't transmitted to other hashkachot. Slowly, slowly it will be. So you have to check every single leaf and separate every leaf if you want to clean cabbage. You can't assume that it's only in the outside. Usually, for care, uh, the opposite, I find in the core, I don't find in the first eight to ten leaves. Okay? Rips. Corn on the cap. Recent topic, right? Ravadi Yosef's son, right? Ravitzik Yosef started talking about corn on the cap, that he was told that there's bugs. There is bugs, there isn't bugs, there could be bugs. It's a good question. So a couple of years ago when I was researching it, I found bugs. I did find bugs. When I trained ladies, I showed, you know, some, you know, find them, as I'm showing. Find thrips, find a different bug. Is it Mia Tomatsu? Is it I don't know. I can't answer that question because I haven't checked thousands of pounds. Okay? I have better things to do in my life than sitting and checking for 15 hours a day pounds and pounds and pounds of produce. Like teaching Torah, right? But Baruch Hashem, we have Hashgachas and Hashgachot that check. So there was a big controversy. Some Hashgachot said it's full of bugs. Some Hashgachot said, no, there's hardly any bugs in there. They believe that it's possible that if you see this cracks and crevices, that bugs could get in there. Nobody could deny that. The question is how common it is. That's the question. So I talked to the OU. I talked to the COR. Anytime you could stop. I talked to... 